Okay, um, I think um, I think let's let's get started here. Um, welcome everybody. My name's Evan. I am the events manager for Booksmith, uh, an independent bookstore and legacy business. It's been a mainstay of the Hate Ashbury since 1976. Uh, thank you all for being here uh, and for supporting Booksmith. Um, we're very happy to partner with the Headland Center for the Arts to bring you a series of distance literary readings. Uh, they've been curated by Emily Wallahan, who is a, an affiliate artist uh, from 2016 to 2019. And tonight we have uh, Tania Lunsford Links and Makosi Anita Tao, um, both artists and residents uh, to, of this year, 2020. And this is the second uh, event of the series. I'm going to turn it over to Emily. Emily's going to be the host for the evening, but um, just uh, a few house items first. Excuse me. So uh, you're all muted, obviously, uh, but we encourage you to use the chat room throughout the event, either to give some love to the authors, uh, to ask questions. Uh, there will be time for Q&A at the end of the program. Um, I, think, I, th I think that's it for me. Um, I'll, I'll turn it over to Emily and, and she'll take it from there. Thank you, Emily. Thanks, Evan. Um, well, I'm really excited about tonight's event and tonight's reading. And um, I want to say a few words about the Headlands for those of you who aren't familiar with it and then introduce our readers. Um, so the Headlands Center for the Arts is located in um, the Marin Headlands, just north of San Francisco. Uh, it is a multidisciplinary and international art center that is dedicated to supporting artists, um, the creative process and the development of new and innovative ideas. Um, it is, in the normal world, a place that has three open houses a, um, a year and a fantastic place to visit um, and to really see art performed and um, installed and exhibited in ways that I've never really seen before. So if anyone here at this reading hasn't yet had the pleasure of going, please, in the future, consider coming. Um, our reading tonight comprises of two uh, artists in residence that should have been here in the spring. And of course, for all of the reasons we all know, um, that's not been possible. But I'm really excited to have them here reading tonight. Um, we've decided that Magosi will go first, so I'm going to introduce her. And, um, and then afterwards, I'll give my introduction for Tania. Um, Magosi Anita Tao is a poet and an award-winning winning filmmaker with a Bachelor of Arts degree in motion picture medium. She created and directs Magosi Live, a show campaign devoted to mental health awareness and activism in Botswana. She recently wrote and directed Section 82, a 24-minute short film about gender-based violence and modern-day slavery. And although I have not had the pleasure of meeting Magosi in person, I've been, spent a bunch of time this past day and for several days actually in her world of film and um, what I could find that's available to me at this like, you know, limited way and have really enjoyed the incredible um, composition of shots and the wonderful spoken word that I've heard. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to read tonight. So I'll pass it over to you and mute myself. Hello, hello everyone. Um, Thank you, Emily, for that beautiful um, introduction. And thank you, Evan, for hosting us. Um, tonight, I'll be reading an excerpt from my memoir. It's work that um, has been a huge part of you know, my thought process about mental health in Africa, in Botswana specifically. And I've been carrying this story for nine years and it's time for me to share it. Um, let me just say that there are certain words that I would like you to understand before I get into the reading. The first being Sabrana Psychiatric Hospital, which is the only psychiatric hospital in Botswana. And then the second being Noha. Noha is a Sotswana word for snake. And it's what I use when I get to the part where I'm talking about my vision and what I was seeing during the time that I was sick. All right. um, I'll begin. 
The word relapse was part of my language now. I avoided it because after many moons of doing my rounds at Sabrana Psychiatric Hospital, the prospects of ever living a normal life were grim. I didn't like the hospital. I was raised by a society that didn't wish madness upon anyone, not even their enemies. It was thought of like a dungeon for mysterious human beings that were cursed or that witchcraft finally caught up with them. I don't recall a time I was ever admitted to Sabrana at free will. It was a place where I had felt isolated from those I loved, a place where one nurse looked at me straight in the eye and said I wasn't going to recover. Once, when I, real, when I resisted an injection, five nurses restrained me. While two held my hands to my back, the other two held my face down to the floor. I fought to free myself and stopped when one of the nurses hit my head repeatedly with her block heel. I was sedated and Sabrana was never quite the same again for me. It was difficult to convince me that it helped me in any way. When I was not in the hospital, I spent my days at home watching television. Movie magic, the channel I watched on most days, repeated movies old and new alike. This one time I watched Basic Instinct, I felt like I was watching my life unfurl before my eyes. Miss Trammell sat in a gray room surrounded by men. Her confidence was much more than mine when I sat in for my monthly checkups. She wore white, sat like she owned the city and blew me away. There is no smoking in this building, Miss Trammell. One of the men spoke. What are you going to do? Charge me with smoking? She said right before lighting up her cigarette. I craved deeply and got up to go and get my own. It was the festive season and the bars were always busy during that time. I went to the bar in my hood, sat by the benches under the tree and waited for smokers to pass over the cigarette. Some rarely shared a cigarette. Some saw the yearning and were generous enough to give and better yet to buy cigarettes for me. I liked spending time with smokers. They believed in sharing stories, cigarettes and ports. I didn't drink at this point. I was exhausted from living in the hospital and resorted to smoking only instead. The Block 9 youth loved their fun. It was routine to dress up, put on some makeup and sit under the bench. That was the starting point. Some would then go for chill sessions, parties, and then later the club. I couldn't do any of those. The one time I tried going for a session, I saw ghosts emerging from the bright smoke and was too afraid to stay. I relapsed too many times and I was trying not to go to the hospital again. I dragged the cigarette and filled my lungs with smoke, held it in for a few seconds and slowly let it go. It eased me. I didn't have the money for it, but it felt better when the cigarette was wet from the lips of another smoker. It made me feel like I wasn't alone. It was the one habit I kept even when doctors told me it wasn't going to work well for me because nicotine was a deterrent for my meds to work. They told me not to drink, and I didn't drink. They told me not to smoke, and I felt they were overstepping their boundaries. I had to have some control over my life. I didn't, though because every time I watched television and I saw someone smoke, I stood up to go searching for unfinished cigarettes by the road near the tuck shop 
or better yet for smokers that could see my yearning. Dim shadows quickly settled over Kali Hill. That's when I knew I had missed my evening dose of medicine. It wasn't long before I heard a hissing sound in my head. I couldn't hold still the cigarette I so desperately wanted to smoke. I felt like I was not going to survive the night, that I would cease to exist and never make it home. I was confused. So I stood up and walked back home through the passage. All I could see was cars flickering their headlights to the rhythm of the hiss in my head. I tried to count them hoping to feel normal by the time I reached the 20th car. I had to find my way back home. I looked over to the stars and a snake the size of a mountain curled over the skyline. Its eyes were burnt orange. The fire with red and purple flames blazing through the night sky. The tiniest of its luminous scales was the size of my body. It had wings that swept through the clouds to reach me. I ran from one end of the compound to another screaming, Noha! I found my way back home, but so did the snake. I ran through the gate sliding past the chubby guard on duty who tried to stop me. She followed me, panting loudly behind me, as did the men and women who left their homes to watch me. Noha! I continued to scream. Ikai! they asked, searching the ground in panic. I lifted my hand, pointed to the sky, and said, Kiele. They all went silent. Some motorists swerved off the road to see what was going on. I ran across the street hoping to wear out the snake. It never moved. Instead, it looked at me, fire burning its eyes to my own. My mother stood by the gate with my little sister begging me to come home. The snake was refusing to go so I couldn't come home. I couldn't risk bringing it home to harm my family. Some of our neighbors told me that the snake had gone. I closed my eyes and opened them, but the snake was still there. I ran back to the bar. The snake followed me still. The hissing sound in my head grew louder and louder, louder, and sharper. I ran across the parking lot until a police officer, tall and skinny, with a black staff in his hand, approached me. He paused for a minute. I thought he was there to catch the snake until I saw my mother in the distance pointing towards me. That's when I realized that I was the catch. He led me to a police van and asked me to come with him. The back of the van was cold and I sat in the corner surrounded by two policemen. After a long drive, the van stopped moving and one officer helped me get off. My mother reached for my hand and I refused her. I had relapsed. A relapse meant I was going to Sabrana. Wait, I was in Sabrana again. Thank you, that was wonderful. If we were all in a room together, it would be filled with Applause, right? Right, Tania? Yeah, like, um, it was just incredible, incredibly moving, incredible imagery. Uh, so much power in the way you formed that. It was just, yeah. Okay. 
Um, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to have a Q&A at the end, so I'm just going to lead into um, introducing Tania and then we can have a proper opportunity to really talk about this incredible work we're hearing. Um, so, uh, Tania Lunsford Lynx is a fourth generation Black San Franciscan on both sides. Tania is a proud alum of Voices of Our Nation, or VONA, and the Lambda Literary Retreat. In 2018, she co-curated Still Here For, Existence as Resistance, a performance featuring queer Black San Franciscans as a part of the National Queer Arts Festival. Um, Tania has been awarded an individual artist grant from the San Francisco Arts Commission, as well as res residencies at the Headlands for the Ar Center for the Arts and um, the Studio Center, Squaw Valley, and Under the Volcano, or Vermont Studio Center, sorry. Um, I've had the pleasure of reading some of Tania's work online and just really uh, was immediately drawn in by the force of imagery and incredible um, syntax and diction and all of the other things that writers do. <laughs> so I'm really excited to hear what um, we're going to uh, hear from you tonight. And I will unmute myself and hand it over to you. Yay. Thank you all for having me. I'm so grateful to be in my house and on your little screen. Um, I am um, Tanya Lens for Links. I'm going to read something that is very much a work in progress. Um, and I created this piece during Shelter in Place uh, while considering my relationship to perfection um, and while trying to undo some of its harmful effects on my imagination and my sense of humor. Um, and so before I begin, I'd like to offer a quote and a question to consider. Uh, the quote is from the Spice Girls, and it goes, spice up your life. Uh, I brought that quote because um, in my consideration of perfection, I realized that I've been asking myself the question over and over again of what kind of fun could you be having if you stopped living as if you were just failing at perfection? Um, so this is part of that answer to that question. Uh, it's an imperfect, very new piece called More Than You Know, uh, The New Intimacy, and it's a monologue delivered to an audience via Zoom. Here it is. More Than You Know, The New Intimacy. Just one question before I start. Can I cuss here? Fucking great. Well, welcome to this curated corner of my kitchen. Uh, I've never had so many strangers in my house, in my kitchen before. And so I'm kind of feeling like a ham, like I have to entertain you, you strangers in my kitchen. Um, and I can only imagine within the silence of your laughter. And isn't that terrifying? Uh, this is the new intimacy, welcome. Uh, you know, I had a bad dream like this before, and it lasted the entire year of 2014. Um, and the whole bad dream was called Under Severe Stress. Uh, many nights when I began to fall asleep, all the conversations of a heavily trafficked intersection began to heat up in my ears. And I still remember hearing the tint and texture of a man's voice in my ear complaining to his daughter about his dry cleaning, which kept me from sleeping. Um, growing up, the voices my mother heard were characters at our dinner table, and this memory of seeing her lose a one-way argument was still ever-present in 2014, and so I figured I might have a bigger problem than just eavesdropping. Um, the man continued to complain about his dry cleaning whenever I went to sleep at night, so I went to Kaiser. Who here has Kaiser? Don't raise your hands. Don't raise your hands. Kaiser fucking sucks. Can I say that? Uh, don't answer that. I mean what I mean what I said, and I'm prepared to be held accountable in the three to six weeks when a therapist can see me for 35 minutes. Um, I went to a psychiatrist. I sat in a chair or a couch or someone's brittle breaking back by the window. The psychiatrist sat opposite me wearing a vest over a long sleeve sweater. Maybe she had a foot heater under her desk, not sure. But she sat between two screens that she ticked away at. So why are you here? Do you want medication? Whoa, 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 I thought. 
let's not get ahead of ourselves. I came to complain and talk circularly about my deepest fears before finding out that this is just the tip of the iceberg of what's wrong with me. Then I wanted to be referred to a therapist who I could see semi-regularly who could convince me that I had the power to not become both of my parents, not lose my mind, not die, not lose my mind, become both of my parents by ingesting them, then die of heartburn. So I asked, well, did you read my chart? My leg crossed one over the other. The thing I was sitting on coughed suggestively. I held the underbelly of a wine glass in my hand. There was less than a swig of wine left. I made the wine dance with a little shift of my wrist to look at the legs in the glass. I leaned in toward her, although she was across the room. Yes. She paused her typing and lowered her glasses to look at me over the top of them. But she wasn't wearing any glasses. Two construction working men with bird heads sat on an elevated beam to eat their lunch on the tiny windowsill to the left of my head. They had instigating eyes. You read the mom stuff? I muttered. Yes. I leaned in with my right shoulder like a secret coming out of the side of my mouth. The dad stuff? Yes. The thing in college and the gay stuff and the under severe stress she said. Do you want medication or not? I told her no. I just wanted to confirm whether or not I was actively becoming my mother, and if not, I wanted to know how long it would take, and if not, I wanted to know what was wrong with me. I threw the swig of wine in her face on my way out of her office, but she didn't seem to notice. The glass failed to shatter as I tossed it down. It failed to make a noise. It failed to exist. Under severe stress, she had said. I want to ask her about this year 2020 bad dream. Does this count as severe stress, a global pandemic? People laughing silently on tiny little Brady Bunch boxes on my computer screen? Does this count? Can you tell me what's wrong with me now? Welcome to the new intimacy, where I have to smile with my whole hairline to infer what's happening behind a thick cloth that hides my mouth. Where someone's turning away from me while they speak could be mistaken as a care so deep it would later be considered during my new 3 a.m. thought loop as a sexual advance. I think to myself, by the way she turned away from me, I could have sworn that she really liked me, liked me. This is the new intimacy. You know, I actually have a thing and I'm curious if you'll look at it. So let me just adjust myself so you can see. Okay, look, but don't get too close. Does this look normal? Does this look normal to you? I can't tell, does this look normal? This is the new intimacy. And I'm so deeply grateful that you are also suffering with me in your own home. It makes me feel really good to know that I'm not the only one washing my underwear in the shower and throwing my empty, battered Tupperware on the floor because the noise makes me feel less alone. It makes me feel warm knowing that you are also thinking in the twilight dust of half sleep about what other things you could use as toilet paper so that you can sleep through your wake up alarm and avoid the morning run to wait in line at the store in full apocalypse drag. Thank you for your suffering. It has served me much more than you know. Well, I hope you got what you came here for. Uh, I appreciate you making the long trek to my kitchen. I think, well, I know it's hard to listen to someone open up and be so vulnerable, but this is the new intimacy. Sharing our bad dreams is what it's all about. After this, we'll all just go home or to the rest of our homes and go to bed around three or four. And when we wake up, it will all be just like it was today. This is the new intimacy. I'm sorry we don't have better endings here. I haven't got to that part of the bad dream yet. I have a hard time sleeping under severe stress. 
um, before I put myself back on mute, uh, I wanted to speak briefly to the context of 2014 and its invocation in this piece. Uh, while I have um, been creating this piece to add humor and nuance to the mental health struggle and mental health conversation, I'm invoking a year when Black organizing was heating up all over the country in response to the murders of Black people at the hands of police and other white supremacist vigilantes. In that year, 2014, I felt the strongest I've ever felt because I was in community of folks who were fighting for our freedom just to be young, black, and outside. Uh, but it was also the most fearful I've ever been, knowing that every 28 hours a black person was killed just for being black and outside, or black and inside for that matter. Uh, so while I'm centering COVID-19 and the effects of this unprecedented moment on our mental health, I'm also speaking to the treatment of black people in this moment, which is growing more and more horrific. So um, I have a closing question and an ask. Uh, the question is, how do you use, how do you use uh, the new possibility of this moment? Um, and what is possible within this moment? Um, and my ask is, I would love if you could use um, some of your possibility to support the family and community of Ahmaud Arbery, uh, who's a Black person who was murdered by two white supremacists while he was on a jog last week. Um, despite his murder being recorded on camera, his murderers have not been arrested. Uh, and it was just recently announced that after a lot of pressure, uh, the case will be brought before a grand jury. Um, but I urge you to visit runwithmod.com, that's runwithmod.com, to figure out what you can do to extend your possibility uh, to this family. Thank you all. Thank you, Tania. Um, wonderful piece and incredible questions. And I really want to um, encourage those that are here to uh, ask questions in the chat for both of our writers and perhaps responses to um, Tania's call. Uh, to get us started, I guess I'll just start kind of asking some questions of both of the writers. Um, but um, I was really, I don't know, I was really struck both, I, I think I'm going to start I mean, I was struck by the kind of dreamscape of both pieces. Um, the incredible snake uh, of your piece, Magosi, uh, just it felt so visceral. Um, and then the incredible, I mean, it, it struck me with the uh, scene in a, I guess, pseudo-therapist's office. I've just recently joined Kaiser and now am terrified. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> uh, but with the imagined wine glass and just with the, you know, other imaginings and um, yeah, the psychic landscape of both pieces really struck me as interesting. And I wondered if you, either of you would speak to um, how that imagery grew in these individual pieces and might also uh, be related to your other work um, and how the kind of like reality of the moment is served by the uh, psychic space and by the kind of your unreality of um, other quite visceral feelings that feelings and experiences that we have. I don't know if either, if, I mean, I can ask more questions, but um, I don't know if either of you want to respond to that. I might need that again. Oh. <laughs> I'm just kind of curious about, um, given that there were psychic, incredible psychic spaces in both pieces, um, like how that uh, grew in these. Grew uh, in these uh, oh, sorry, I was hearing an like an echo of myself. But grew in these, uh, in in these pieces, uh, in but also how that uh, is a um, a tool that you use in your other work. Sure. Um, I, the use of like reality in the question is um, so real because even in like the imagination of these moments, uh, they are reality to someone. They are very real mm -hmm. uh, to someone. And so I think uh, the ways that that influences my work um, is just knowing and holding that there are so many realities uh, happening at the same time, whether we can see them or be in them or not. Um, and some of them are important realities um, and some of them um, are fantastical and some of them are scary. 
Uh, mm. So I find that when I'm doing my job well, I'm making room uh, for more realities to be true at the same time, to be in conflict uh, at the same time, for the fantastical to peek through, you know, as reality that we walk past every day and don't realize is, you know, miracle in the making. Um, and so it, it happens in all of my work, whether that's um, fictional or creative nonfiction or even poetry. I'm kind of always trying to make room for, for kind of also like desensitizing um, things that I have become um, used to and uh, things that are kind of social agreements about what's normal. And sometimes that includes like saying something over and over and over again until it's like, this is strange. Why is nobody freaking out about this? Um, I use this example all the time of like, we have jails for kids in the United States. Like say that 15 times and freak yourself out. You know what I mean? Like, and it, that's normal for everyone and that's our reality, but it's not normal. Um, and how do we become used to this, for example? Um, I'd also like to say that, you know, my, my work uh, being an interdisciplinary artist, um, it kind of affords me a, a chance to carry my, my stories into my films, into my poetry. But with this memoir, I realized that I've been running away from writing it for the longest time. I've done a lot of work with mental health awareness and trying to educate people in Botswana about mental health. But one of the things I, I realize and I recognize as I read and as I listen to myself read is, is that I was running away because it was the things I feared the most that I did not want to, you know, to look at again or to see or to feel. And so, in writing this, it wasn't, for me, it wasn't about imagination as much as it was about remembrance. I could recall quite vividly everything as it happened. And for some people, it's quite a shock that I was able to sit down and actually remember everything that I, I saw, everything I endured, everything I smelled, I felt. All those things are still even to date. To this day, I can still feel, I can still see them. But now I'm not seeing them from the perspective of somebody suffering, but I'm seeing them from the perspective of somebody who has overcome and wants to kind of change, you know, the narrative of African mental health by sharing my own personal encounter and story of overcoming. And what I realized when you were asking the question as well, it got me to think about my film, Section 82. And there's a scene where we had to use a snake and it was one of the most difficult things uh, for my crew and I to overcome in filming that scene. But I realized that when I wrote that scene, I was writing what I knew. I wasn't writing something new to me. And so writing this memoir is, is, is remembering and feeling again, smelling again, seeing again, sometimes just closing my eyes and recalling and seeing it and feeling it, it makes it come alive again. That's so interesting. And um, I, I find I've recently been working on something where I'm trying to use my memory. And um, I feel like such a barrier to actually like, be right back in that moment and um, remember things from a long time ago. So it's amazing to hear your like visceral um, memory of these uh, moments. I guess my question is, do you feel that was something that was always available to you or has recently become available through maybe the distance of time or maturity or um, perhaps your artwork of being able to make a film that uses a snake and the kind of like steps they go towards having that access to the memory. Um, I think as Maya Angelou once said, it's, it's really necessary for us as artists to reflect 
and to use those reflections to question, you know, to question the things that we see, to question the things that we experience, to question what is, you know, carrying the potential to change the life that we know as it is. So I will say that I, I've grown up refusing the fact that I'm a seer and I'm a dreamer or I'm a visionary. I can see visions. It's something that I, 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 I dealt with and kind of fought with. And only until I overcame that period of my life was I able to now use it for the, the good. Because at first I was, it was, for me, it was difficult. It was very disorienting to just be able to close my eyes and see things that were, were not good, things that I didn't associate with good. It was hard, especially with the kind of taboo that mental health still is in Botswana. Sharing those things wasn't easy. The best for me to have done at that point in time was to just write the little that I could remember. But I would say that we need to embrace who we are. If you're a seer, if you're a dreamer, you need to embrace it and you need to kind of own your story and allow it to live through you. Because once you start realizing the, the possibilities and the potential that your own story is carrying for those that will listen or read it, it just opens you up to being able to deal with the vulnerability and just giving people access to yourself and your soul. Thank you. That's wonderful. It's um, brave to be so vulnerable and to share so much. Um, a phrase that you were using, Tania, that really struck me is, um, which you repeated several times, the new intimacy, um, quite effectively. I loved that punctuation throughout your piece of the new intimacy. Um, and I guess I now am thinking like, when we're thinking about mental health um, and or social justice, uh, I'm curious what both of you might think about this somewhat enforced new intimacy that we're currently experiencing and where it might um, somewhat, it's like completely enforced, um, but where, how it might connect to, um, I guess, either a reality of dealing with mental health issues, a reality of social justice or activism towards both of those. And if you see any, um, I guess specific ways that this idea of a new kind of virtual intimacy of the awkwardness that it enforces on us, but also the vulnerability that it actually does also provide. Um, this is a very unformed um, question, very unformed but, question, but <laughs> um, I would love for you to speak to the connection to between, those between those two. I think the connection we're using like possibility, um, like thinking more often what is possible. Um, when I, like I, I struggle a lot with anxiety and depression and in those states, uh, so much feels impossible. Um, so much feels inaccessible. Um, and in this moment, when I think about what is not possible, like I can't go outside in the ways that I used to. I can't do the things that I used to do to take care of myself in the same way. Um, I have to think about what's possible for me um, to continue moving in a way that is um, good for me. And, you know, sometimes, I mean, like in the case of this and bringing this piece, it is like thinking about silliness, thinking about the absurdness of this moment. Um, like having, inviting my sense of humor to come back, um, to be playful. Uh, and I think that gets to the question of kind of intimacy and social justice as well, because um, because those things are forms of resistance, um, whether we're in this, you know, whether we're stuck indoors or not, uh, to play, to create beauty, to, um, be humorous. It's like laughing in, in the face of something that's like, you don't laugh. You know, this is very serious. Um, and there should be no fun here. 
But I mean, fun is my main, like I wouldn't be here. <laughs> I, I would not be here uh, if I didn't create a way for myself to, to survive. Um, and, you know, play is my way right now. I'm riding it. Thanks. That's wonderful. Um, I, yeah, the role of humor right now, like I've always been convinced of the like supremacy of humor in all things, but I've never been more convinced than now. Um, I'll go see, I don't know if you had anything to add to just this new virtual world we find ourselves in and how it might connect to or even benefit mental health issues um, or anything like that. guys about this season this time is that it has brought many to realize the the power or you know the need to care for their mental health there's never been a time that people needed to be more aware of themselves you know to spend time in isolation to spend time away from their loved ones and to be forced rather to opt or you know for communication in ways that they were never used to before but what i also realize is in the same time i think it also allows for humanity to you know experience a deeper level of empathy for one another there is a lot more accountability for for people for those that we we might not even necessarily have met before but for the simple fact that we are in here sharing this universal, you know, pandemic, this universal crisis, we're here, we're feeling it together, and we might not be, you know, feeling it in the same way, experiencing it in the same specific way, but by the fact that, you know, we are, we are all wondering, with so much uncertainty, we are all experiencing fear to a certain extent, that is going to enable us to feel together and to feel for one another in a way that we have never felt before. And that's, that's, that's the one thing I'm appreciating about this time. More people are recognizing that mental health, there's no health without mental health. And people are forced to, to get to know themselves better, to get to sit with their struggles, you know, to confront their problems. And it's never been easy to do that, you know, with all kind of noise and commotion, but in the silence and the sacredness of that space of isolation, it, it, it forces one to wonder and to ponder, what have I been doing right? What have I not been doing right? And when we get to spaces such as these, where we can exchange and share, you, you are left with a lingering thought of, I should really do better, or I have been doing better. But one thing remains, we are all in this boat together. And that is the prize. Um, yeah, I mean, that really speaks to that idea of intimacy. But the, um, the notion that it is, you know, a, like a global intimacy um, is humbling. Um, Heidi has asked a question and um, she says, thank you so much for this so much incredible, for discussion. incredible discussion. I uh, would love to hear uh, what specific you. things are feeding your soul during this time. Um, hi, Heidi. Uh, thank you for the beautiful question. I think the video calls that I do with my, my son and my parents, my whole family, um, and the few friends I have are really doing, doing me good. Also the artist community that I've been building over the years has allowed me to see people still and have people to communicate with. I'm reading a lot more than I've been reading before and binge watching a lot of movies. Yes, yes, <laughs> it's been really similar for me. Um, seeing my family, talking to my friends um, has been really, really special and saving me. 
I also have been reading a lot. It is the cheapest vacation ever, and I love it. Um, and I appreciate you for naming binge watching because I will just say, before this all happened, I started Grey's Anatomy at the beginning of the year. There are 16 seasons and I needed that kind of commitment. So I started and I'm at season 10. I read ahead and I know that Christina Yang is leaving and you all are gonna need to check on me in about two weeks because I may not be okay. I love her so much and she's my quarantine buddy. Oh, that's so awesome. Um... I love the quarantine buddy that's like a character from a show from years ago, but you know, we, you take what you need, right? Um, so I'm curious what you're reading though. You both are mentioned, cause you know, some people find it like I, they can't read a thing and then others are like, oh my gosh, I've never had so much time. Um, so please tell us what you're reading. Um, I'm currently reading uh, Black Boy by Richard Wright. And I enjoyed like Homegoing by Yag Yassi. Yes. Um, I am reading Every Day is for the Thief uh, by Tiki <laughs> Cole. Um, and I just finished uh, The Dream House uh, by Carmen Maria Machado. And both are amazing. Awesome. What do you have anything on your nightstand coming up? Yes, all of the books that I did not get to last year. Um, I still haven't, I've read halfway through Zadie Smith's essays, uh, The Thick Book Feel Free. So I still have like half of those to finish. Um, and then I have, uh, I have Lydia Yuknovich. Lydia Yuknovich. Uh, uh, the little book like this, it's called Owl, I think, or something like that. And that was kind of uh, I'm yet to read uh, Ocean Vong, and I haven't chosen the one after that. There's a stack that I, I have, and I'm supposed to be picking one every time I, I can read that Ocean Vuong is the next, the next book. That's wonderful. That's inspiring to me. I've been meeting to read, um, I've read Ocean Vuong's book of poems, but I haven't read his uh, most recent fiction and I've been meaning to read that. So I should put that on my pile. Um, well, I just want to, uh, if, if the audience has anything more, any other questions, please throw them into the chat and I'll get to them. But um, if not, I want to just thank both of you for your beautiful readings and your openness and willing to share, willingness to share with us. Um, it's been, it has, it has felt closer. I feel like these readings feel closer than they might do in a bookstore, you know? We are peering into each other's faces. Um, speaking, as you had point out, Tanea, to the silence, <laughs> just assuming that those smiles are going, you know, have chuckles underneath them. Mine do. Um, so I hope that I do get to meet you um, in the future and that the Headlands is a place that we meet each other at. Um, but until then, I... Thank you for your reading and wish you the very best and um, say good night. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, I guess, I guess there aren't more questions. I just wanted to thank you, Tania, and thank you, Makasi. Um, you were both wonderful. And um, Emily, thank you for hosting. This was, this was great. And I think we're going to have another, another um, re a reading at a distance event. Yes, um, in just in a few weeks, we'll sort it out and put out the information. Beautiful. And you can find out uh, more about Booksmith's upcoming events at booksmith.com. So hopefully we can all meet in, in person sometime soon. But um, everybody take care and, and, and hopefully we'll, we'll see you in another uh, meeting uh, between now and then. 
And a, a quick, huge thanks to you, Evan, and to the Booksmith and for this partnership. It's, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Take Thank care. Thank you so much for having us. And I'm so grateful to have been part of this tonight. Thank you, the Booksmith. And thank you, Headlands. Thank you, Emily. And thank you, Tania, for your beautiful, beautiful story. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.